Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Michael McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spokely Institute. Uh, we are delighted with the Europe Center, which is part of FSI and uh, part of Stanford Global Studies as well, to be hosting this event. Um, we have been doing, for those of you who are not on our mailing list, we have been doing a series of talks, roundtables, discussions um, related to European security. We call it Therefore, the European Security Initiative, how creative is that? ESI, for those of you who like acronyms, we in government like acronyms. Just, I encourage you to go to our website at FSI and look up ESI for uh, speakers that are uh, coming both this fall and again in the spring. Today, I think, though, is in many ways the highlight or the focal point. Uh, no, actually, maybe really is tomorrow, General. Uh, who knows? But uh, we are delighted to have somebody who the phrase European security is not just an abstraction, it's his daily business. Uh, General Grebov is, as you know, the commander of the U.S. Uh, European Command and the NATO Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. I love that title, by the way. Supreme <laughs> Allied Commander. Ambassador is pretty good, but Supreme Allied Commander, that's something, uh, that's a special title. Um, and therefore, in terms of the threat from Russia and new security challenges, uh, nobody is uh, closer to that uh, set of issues than our speaker today. Uh, before assuming his current position in 2013, General Breedlove served as the commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe and commander of U.S. Air Forces in Africa, among other positions. He's also completed numerous stints in Washington, among them Vice Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, Senior Military Assistant to the Security of the Air Force, Secretary of the Air Force, and Vice Director for Strategic Plans and Policy on the Joint Staff. He's also done two tours, I think, in Korea, so we were discussing three tours of duty in Korea, as we were discussing yesterday. So he very much understands security challenges from some of our greatest uh, uh, challenges. Um, he's also a commander, he's a commander, uh, he's a pilot by trade with over 3,500 flying hours, primarily in the F-16. He's flown combat missions in Operation Joint Forge, supported the peacekeeping operation in Bosnia, and Operation Joint Guardian to implement the peace settlement in Kosovo. We could not have a more well-informed person to speak about European security, and we're really grateful, General Lake, to come to the U.S. Thank you. So when these introductions are being given, you're, you're always wondering who are they talking about. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. It's really unusual for me to be this far west. Um, and I will return to Belgium right after this because there are a few things going on in Europe that I need to attend to. I feel right at home though because this is the kind of weather we have in Belgium. I was really coming here. <laughs> I was really coming here to get some sunshine, and it didn't work out so well for me. But I am privileged to be here to discuss uh, what I think is a rapidly evolving security situation in Europe. The most important thing that's going to happen here is not that you listen to me for the next 15 to 20 minutes. What's most important is that after that, I'm looking forward to your questions and answers and having a conversation with you, frankly. As at dinner last night, I thought that was the best part of what happened, was, uh, was our conversation. So for better or for worse, Europe has a long history of, of being influenced by and influencing the economies, cultures, and the policies of all its neighboring regions. Europe is home to the majority of our most capable allies and partners, and peace in Europe requires hard work. Hard work and dedication to a collective set of ideals and values. The strong international ties and collective commitment to each other remain the foundation for our alliance. I am very proud of the NATO alliance. I've served in NATO and in Europe eight times, and as you heard, I served three times in Asia. And our alliance, I think, is a great force for good. Considering the alarming rate of change We've seen with regards to the European geopolitical situation in the last year, I think that this commitment to NATO and to our collective security is absolutely critical. The strategic security environment of Europe is evolving and remains highly dynamic. We talk much 
of what is happening to our east and what is happening to our south. In the east, Europe faces a rebranches and a resurgent Russia, which has moved forward with a strategy to fundamentally change internationally accepted norms as they assert themselves on the global stage. Russia isn't seeking to disobey the rules. Russia is seeking to rewrite the rules. Not long ago, our nation was looking to make Russia a partner. I publicly myself spoken about building bridges to Russia. Some call it hugging the bear. The strategy that Russia has opted to pursue is a different and it poses a significant threat to Euro-Atlantic security. Across the spectrum of national power, they have been aggressive and coercive in their use of diplomatic, informational, military, and economic tools. Most troubling is that Russia has used military force to, to promote their relaunchist agenda. Bottom line, Russia has once again put military force on the table in order to change internationally recognized borders. Coupled with this, Putin has used his well-developed strategic communications playbook of redirection, denials, lies, and omissions to create enough ambiguity to deflect outright condemnation from the Western world. Unencumbered by the truth, Russia has spun events to meet the desires of multiple audiences. Their population, their adversaries, and the world writ large all hear what they want them to hear. And the truth becomes clouded by fabrication. As we have seen in Ukraine and Crimea, Moscow believes that through demonstrations of military strength, they can bully neighboring nations and effectively subjugate a nation's sovereignty. They have conducted large-scale hybrid warfare actions to violate and redraw internationally accepted borders and dramatically alter the security environment in Europe. Many believe that Putin's strategy has been to destabilize and then redirect attention by creating further distractions. But Putin's greater goal is to destabilize NATO and chip away at the strength of our alliance. <clears throat> Putin's portfolio of instability is reliant on the fact that he creates enough chaos to upend the previous security norms, but not to the point of instigating a large-scale reaction from the past. <coughs> of late, there are more examples of these strategic, strategic actions occurring in the northern part of Europe. I reflect upon a recent meeting where I was discussing NATO's strategic directions east and south. During this meeting, Norway's Minister of Defense, a really sharp uh, young lady, challenged me by pointing out that there is an ever-growing Russian presence and potential threat in the north. The facts are that Russia has undertaken great efforts to militarize the north under the guise of search and rescue and economic development. Russia has made claims for ownership of vast portions of the Arctic. And they have also conducted various military exercises that are of increasing concern to all the members of the Arctic Council nations, to include Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia itself, Sweden, and the United States. Additionally, more recently, Japan has objected to extensive militarization of the Kuril Islands. This is all about extending Russian control and setting conditions to contest, contest access in that region. Why else would they conduct large-scale military exercises, build new military installations, and establish plans to have a permanent military presence there? And, then, and as Europe looks to the south, which is a growing issue, as you know from the papers. There exists a mix of challenges. I can almost guarantee you across every front page, newspaper, or website in Europe, there's a story detailing the many concerns of mass migration emanating from the Middle East. This humanitarian crisis within Europe has no foreseeable end in sight. <coughs> 
and there are no foreseeable solutions that nations within Europe have yet to fully agree on. This is complicated and strained regional, bilateral, and multilateral relationships. The situation is also creating serious political problems for national leadership. Countries who have committed resources for assistance now find their resources are running out or will run out soon. Additionally, among these refugees, the sheer numbers of men and women and children is staggering. But inside those numbers are embedded problems of organized crime and the nearly untraceable flow of terrorists and foreign fighters coming and going from Syria. Many of these fighters aspire to carry out Charlie Hebdo-style attacks, which obviously have profound effects on the collective psyche of Europe. Incidents such as that one and several others to include the recent shooter on the train who was fortunately stopped, has served to increase concern and vigilance in Europe. Unfortunately, the best we can hope for it today is to stay ahead of the growing number of radicalized individuals plotting similar attacks. Preventing these attacks requires grand scale synchronized efforts of both international and national agencies. So as we face an adventurous Russia to the east and a toxic mix of challenges to the south, they intersect with Russia's intervention in Syria. The situation in Syria is very difficult to define, but to sum up in this time I have allotted, in brief, Assad, with Russian support, is fighting to regain control of this country. The rebels, or the Free Syrian Army, some of which we support, endeavor to oust him. And ISIL, or you will hear me in Q&A called him Daesh, aspires to create a caliphate across the Middle East. To analyze Russia's involvement in Syria, we must begin, begin with a two-part question. What does Russia hope to get out of their involvement in Syria? And how does this fit their overall strategy? First, Russia is striving to project itself as a world power, and they see their involvement in Syria as an opportunity to promote the concept. From the viewpoint of Putin, preserving a regional puppet in the Assad regime is critical to Russia maintaining influence in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. <clears throat> Added to this effort, Russia has built an alliance with Iran and Hezbollah. Russia's military basing in Syria at both the Port of Tartus and the Latakia Air Base supports these aims and the future role of these bases I do not think should be underestimated. Second, as I alluded to earlier, this is an opportunity to shift the world's attention from the situation in Ukraine and Crimea and other places where Russia has and is still influencing nations. In Syria, Putin has perpetuated more of the half-truth strategic messaging. Russia is in Syria under false pretense. And while Putin claims Russian forces are there to fight ISIL, which they have done to a minimal extent, Russia has made significant efforts to attack any and all rest rebels hostile to the Assad regime. And any responsible person who examines the forces Russia has deployed to Syria, quickly, quickly will conclude it just doesn't add up. You don't need high-end surface-to-air weapons or advanced air-to-air -air capabilities like he has deployed to fight Daesh. There's a clear gap between Putin's words and his actions. He has created an environment that denies access and limits any chance for the regime change to occur from within or with outside influence. On the other hand, Putin has chosen to embark on a military campaign in a region where political solutions are extremely difficult to attain and military operations are complicated and costly. <coughs> Only time will tell if this move will ever extend Russia. Time is Russia's most daunting strategic challenge, I think, in Syria. But if we believe that Russia's strategy in Syria is to keep Assad or someone in line who is along with Russian thinking in 
power. This will have a serious second and third order effect. It most certainly complicates and will pro prolong the already dire humanitarian situation in Syria. And the alliance Russia has built will further alienate Israel to the south and has created a very tenuous situation with Turkey to the north. And if we accept that Russia wants to play a leading role on the world stage, then Russia should start by focusing their efforts on building a lasting peace in Ukraine and Georgia by restoring their internationally recognized borders and bringing stability to that region. Now that would be the leadership on the world stage. But Russia has given no indication that they would be willing to move in either of those directions. Because of that and because of the unprecedented complexity of this security situation in Europe, developing a one-size-fits-all strategy for collective defense is quite difficult. In order to ensure peace and provide credible deterrence, all threats and challenges must be accounted for and frankly contested. Providing security comes at an increased cost, so smart investments and solutions are absolutely necessary. For the last 20 years, the Alliance has operated in the relative peace, relative peace of a post-Cold War environment. Now we are facing two strategic challenges from the East and the South. It's essential that our Alliance rebuilds its capability and capacity to address these two challenges, and we're going to have to do it simultaneously. Our ways and means must enable our ends, and the end state is that Europe must remain whole, free, at peace, and prosperous. Sustained success in this 70-year effort has been reliant upon the strength of our alliance, and relationships built on trust are the cornerstone of that strength. NATO and UCOM's mission in Europe has remained the same. Defend territory, populations, and most importantly, defend our values. To continue to execute this mission successfully, both NATO and UCOM must be ready and responsive. Furthermore, these challenges are not unique to strictly NATO nations, and they rely uh, and require on a level of common strategic goals among nations who desire peace. Ultimately, the United States has been the lead guarantor of peace and stability in Europe since the end of the Cold War. We can never shirk from that mantle of responsibility. Now is not the time to step back and disengage because things are difficult. We are facing a series of critical decisions in the near future on how we will go forth in rebuilding our capabilities and capacity in Europe. Europe is truly at a crossroads, and the decisions we make now will ultimately either secure or lose our security environment. To ensure our nation and the alliance remain strong and united in the, in the face of today's challenges, I believe we must assure our partners with our presence and deter our challengers with our leadership. So once again, I thank you for being able to speak in front of me today. And now, the best part of this will begin. That is, we can go back and forth with questions. So, General, I can stand up here awkwardly and <clears throat> take questions, or you can just run the show yourself. Okay. Thank you. I saw that hand back there for I recommend you do that. But I my colleagues here, yes. uh, if yeah, you could pass out the microphone, and please introduce yourself to our uh, General Greedlove before you ask your question. Okay? Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation and very calm on Russia. <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, I'm Anna Manuel. I teach here at CSAC and former State Department. I wanted to ask you about the one region you didn't mention, which is Afghanistan. And we still have a NATO deployment there. It's shrinking. Now going to shrink um, more slowly than we thought it would. Uh, how do you see the situation there? And is NATO prepared to do 
So it's a superb uh, question, and uh, and obviously big on NATO's mind. Um, as we came out of Wales, we were headed towards the next series of, of uh, downsizing the force in Afghanistan. <clears throat> At the same time, the ANSF, the security forces of Afghanistan, were entering into their first year of truly being alone. Uh, we are there in an advisory, trained advise assist capacity, but we are not fighting alongside of our allies. And, and frankly, we had chosen to begin to wean them off of some of the support which we have given them so much in the past, air support, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so Afghanistan was entering into the first year of fighting the, uh, the Taliban and also some elements of ISIL in Afghanistan by themselves. What we have learned, some of that we expected. <clears throat> Afghanistan, you know, is a huge country. And it is one of the most untrafficable nations in the world if you have to do it by land. You all are well aware of the topography of the mountains, etc., etc. And so the ANSF has had a tough year of fighting the Taliban because they have to defend the whole nation. But the Taliban, the enemy, can choose when and where it concentrates to fight. And so the Afghan forces have had a, a tough year where I actually think they've acquitted themselves pretty well when you consider they are minus strategic mobility, minus close air support, minus intelligence surveillance, reconnaissance, etc. Et but what we have found is that those things that we knew they had to develop over time are probably more important than we actually understood to them. And they, they had some struggles. We all need to, uh, to uh, understand that, especially in the South, as you know. Uh, in a former Taliban stronghold portion of the nation, they've been challenged pretty well. And so uh, our nations of NATO, led by our, our president in the United States, have determined to extend our current level of presence there, to continue to train, advise, assist in a non-combat way, um, the ANSF, and I think it was the right decision. It was my recommendation as well as um, the, the commander who works for me in Afghanistan, uh, General Jason Campbell. So um, I think that we will now use this year to continue to try to build capability, capacity, understanding in uh, the Afghan forces another year to grow their Air Force capability, which is key to them, uh, to be able to move quickly around that huge nation and meet the challenges. And we'll see where this goes. But uh, I am still the glass half full, not empty, on Afghanistan. Why? Because these are uh, Different than other nations in the world, and I won't go there to be critical, but different than some other nations we've been in. The Afghan army wants to fight for its nation. They are a force that is not afraid to take the fight to the enemy. They are not divided along ethnic lines. And they are uh, they are out there trying their, their very best, and I think for that reason, I am um, willing and I recommend that we continue to try to bring them along. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Bob Jensen. I'm just a standard alum. Thank you. Um, two questions that I think are maybe related. The first is going all the way back to when Putin's incursion into Georgia, which was numerous years ago. It seems with regularity he has conducted himself in a, in a manner that we would view as you know, improper or not. Um, and what, is there any reason we assume or think that that is going to change going forward? And the second question, maybe the recent downing of the Russian airliner over the Sinai, if in fact it turns out that's a, a bomb related to ISIS, or how, would, how do you see that impacting Putin's conduct or Russian's conduct on the various uh, topics that you mentioned? Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> so I will take this. Uh, these in two chunks as you presented them. Um, uh, my team will tell you that in almost all cases, I'm an optimist. It's very rare that I say I'm a pessimist about the situation. Um, you asked, will Mr. Putin change? So in 08, it was the invasion 
of, uh, of Georgia. We have also issues where uh, the Russian Federation are on both sides of the issue in the Northern Karabakh. Russia is still in Moldova in the Transnistria region with their forces. Russia has invaded Crimea. Russia has invaded the Donbass. And not seemingly very high on radar scopes, very few don't remember or, or recall that just recently Russia moved the boundaries in South Ossetia again. And when they did that, they covered over a major uh, um, energy transmission point. So they are changing international boundaries in Georgia. And now we see them in Syria. So I build that watch to say, I think I agree with your premise, which is I don't see a change in Mr. Putin's approach to the Western world. As I said in my speech, <clears throat> they're not about breaking the rules, they're about rewriting the rules. I think Mr. Putin looks at the way that the West set up business after the fall of the wall, and he doesn't agree with that. And he wants to change the way that nations relate to each other, and Europe, and his one tool that works very well is force. Force in Georgia, force in nagorno karabakh force in Transnistria, force in Crimea, force in Donbass, force in Georgia, and now force in Syria. So uh, I don't, I'm glass in empty on this change until the Western world or the rest of the world, because some of this is happening in the East as well, as you heard in the discussion about Japan. So the world uh, finds a way to address the issue. It may or may not be military. Maybe sanctions is the right tool, whatever it is. But I, I do not uh, think that he's just going to unilaterally change because he sees that what he's doing is working. It's working. <clears throat> when it comes to ISIS and the airliner, do not allow me to enter into the conversation or make a statement about whether I believe it's a bomb or not. Actually, in the younger part of my life, I was an accident investigator and trying to look at accident scenes, primarily fighter aircraft accident scenes, since I've been flying the S-16 all my life. <clears throat> and what I've learned is if you jump to conclusions, you may have to be embarrassed by your conclusions. So I think that we should allow this to play out and that we should get to the final uh, forensic conclusion. But let's assume, hypothetically, it was a bomb. Um, what does that change? Well, it may have changed Mr. Putin's approach in Syria. As you heard me say before, if you look at actually the data that is publicly available from Russia, you see that in their records, over 80% of their attacks have been against the moderate opposition, not ISIL. No matter what they say, you know, now they've backed away from that. They've actually publicly said at the ministerial level. Yeah, we're not here to bomb ISIL, we're bombing the opposition. <clears throat> we think actually that number is much higher than 80%. Very few of Russia's sorties, sorties so far have been, very, very few of their sorties so far have been against ISIL. It's all about preserving the Assad regime, and so they're bombing the opposition to the Assad regime. But what we have seen in the past, uh, in the Caucasus and other places, that is, if, if a terrorist organization strikes Russia, they usually, in a demonstrative way, uh, retaliate. So I would not uh, want to guess, but history might tell you that this might reorient their bombing campaign a little bit if it truly unfolds that it was Daesh or ISIL that caused the bombing or the bombing of the aircraft. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is uh, Jake. I'm a freshman perspective political science major and a writer for the Political Journal. Uh, what's being done within Europe to get more countries to commit to spend 2% on defense as NATO prescribes, especially in this era of economic slowdown, increasing spending on the migrant crisis, austerity? How do you see that going forward? It's a question I get asked almost every time I stand in front of a group, so thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> So at Wales, as you know, the nations committed to getting their uh, spending up to 2%, but they gave themselves 10 years to do it. So that is questions a little bit, in some minds, the sincerity of the effort. 
Um, but there has been immense pressure politically inside of NATO and bilaterally amongst our nation and others, especially targeting the nations that really are low in their spending. There's, there's a strong commitment politically and militarily to carry this message. Good news and bad news. The bad news is we have a long way to go. The good news is 18 of our nations have stopped declines in their spending. Four or five of the nations now have an incredible plan across a reasonable amount of time, three or four years, to actually raise all the way to 2%. And now I think we have four nations who are at 2%. So I think we have a measurable but modest uh, recognition of there is a threat that has to be dealt with, and the nations are slowly turning themselves around to this. And so I, again, am a not here. Let me tell you what I'm a little more worried about, and that is if you only use the 2% goal, uh, that really doesn't tell the whole story. The other side of this is that we commit to 20% of what we spend in defense on recapitalization and investment. In other words, buying that kit that we need, refurbishing that kit that we have. We have a nation out there that spends well over 2% of its GDP on its military, but it spends almost nothing on recapitalization. So it's all personnel costs, and that is not really helpful. We need to, just like any physical plant, have to keep refurbishing buildings, refurbishing, repairing cars. You translate that into the military. 20% of your investment should be in that recapitalization, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a harder goal for some of our nations to hit. So that's one we have to work on. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Joseph Trigan. I'm a fellow at CSAC. I'd like to ask you to speak to the tension between improving Europe's ability to defend itself and provoking the Russians in a way that makes the situation worse, and also the broader question of meeting Russia's desire, as you say, to rewrite the rules, while also not uh, doing more to fit the Russian narrative that the West is opposed to Russian interests. Sorry, I have to write these down. I turned 60 recently and my mind is going. Okay, so may I answer the first question in a way that will sort of sound rude to you? But I'm, I'm going to answer it that way anyway. And I'll go back over what I just did to talk about a few minutes ago. In a way, Russia invaded Georgia. Russia is on both sides of the fight in Nagorno Karabakh. Russia remains with military forces in Transnistria in Moldova. Russia has invaded Crimea. Russia has invaded uh, the Donbass. Russia has moved the lines in Georgia. And now Russia is in Syria bombing the moderate opposition, which we think is important to making a political change in Syria, which is the solution. So my question to you is, when are we going to be provoked? Why do we, why we, we spend a lot of time trying not to provoke Russia. When are we going to be provoked? You know, so again, I'm not trying to be rude, but I think we have to recalibrate here a little bit what we're thinking about. We tie ourselves in absolute knots trying not to provoke Russia. And they continue to step off these actions. Where is it that our values, our mores, our aspirations for Europe cause us to be provoked? I think that's a good question to discuss. The second one I think is a magnificent question. How do we approach Russia without playing into their narrative that we're surrounding them? What you hear first out of the, the voices of many Russians when you have these conversations is you're surrounding us, you're, you're you're back to contain It's the whole thing again. And if we are intellectually honest, if we were sitting in Moscow, we might actually see it that way, don't you think? But what I would tell you is, at least it is my intellectual vision of what's happened in NATO since I've been in it, 
that we don't go out and say, we need that country to surround Russia, so let's go get them. We need that country to surround Russia, so let's go get them. What we have is a series of nations that want to join the EU or want to join NATO. Nations come to NATO asking to be a part of it. NATO doesn't go out and target in specific ways bringing nations aboard to, uh, to encircle Russia. So I, I think that what I'm trying to say is that I believe part of our value system is that we should expect and want for a nation to have self-determination and where it aligns itself uh, with the values of the West or with the values of its East. Um, and so we have a series of nations who really want to become a part of NATO. Um, and this is a hard thing to fight. And I think you can ask one of the toughest questions that we have to address, which is how do we allow nations to make self-determination a part of our value system and the way they align with the world without antagonizing uh, rather than provoking Russia. So, uh, I have danced all around the head of the pin and I haven't really answered your question because this is what learned people need to be working on right now, is how do we move forward? <clears throat> and frankly, if you heard the, the construction I used in my speech, our nation in almost all its papers for the last 10 years have talked about a uh, year of whole, free, and at peace. I'm an engineer, engineer two times in my degrees. So I'm not really an economist, but I think that I always had and prosperous, whole, free, and peace, and prosperous. Because if we are in a prosperous Europe, and people are working, and their economic situation rises, they are less apt to go running over borders and grabbing land or running over borders for economic reasons. I think to be prosperous in Europe, it would be much easier if we had a partner in Russia. The energy reserves, their internal transportation networks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, could be a very important part of a prosperous Europe. So in the end game, if we can find our way to some better behavior and reach an, what you use the word accommodation, cooperation, or whatever with Russia. We're much more apt to end up in a prosperous situation, which I think settles down a lot of the tension. So um, I think, to your question about how do we not meet their narrative, we don't have those answers yet. But I do believe we need to commit to a time where we could probably find ourselves in some sort of relationship with Russia that allows us to have a better chance of a prosperous Europe. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Morgan Kaplan. I'm a pre-doctoral fellow at CSAC here, and I'm an optimist as well. And my question kind of builds on this, and that is, where do we find the first step towards cooperation with the Russians? Um, and is that first step actually potentially in Syria? Precisely because if there was going to be some sort of reorientation of Russian policy towards attacking ISIL and Daesh, and if we also kind of think that the Russians have always had a strategic partnership with Syria, it's not so much a revision, then maybe that could be the first place where we could start, and that could affect other less Russian tensions. So this is uh, another seminal question, and we were talking about it just at lunch, and I was talking about it with Secretary Cohen just a little while ago. I'm sorry, Terry. Sorry. Worked for a lot of secretaries. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this discussion, I said that if Russia wants to be a partner or show us good behavior or show that they want to be uh, a cooperative and collaborative force on the world front, I think the place that we need to start is in Donbass or Crimea. If we allow them to get us all focused on Syria so that we forget what's going on over here, then we normalize what's going on in Ukraine and accept it. I think the world has already, I'll use bad words, written off Crimea. I don't think that the world is ready to challenge Russia over Crimea. We're using words which say we don't accept the annexation 
annexation. That's a really soft word for the invasion that happened. Okay, so so you suppose that maybe we should start in Syria. I would propose that it has to back up a little bit. Remember that string of things that we talked about that started in 08 in Georgia. Every time we move to a new one, we normalize and forget the last one. Who's talking about Nagorno Karabakh? Who's talking about Transnistria? How many people are really talking about Crimea? So if we move on to Syria, does that mean that we're normalizing Donbass? Uh, that would not be my point. I think that Russia has to find a place where they make a step towards the rest of the world and say, as a responsible partner, we are going to get this right. Reset the international border. The internationally recognized border in Ukraine. Reset the internationally recognized borders in Georgia. These would be great first steps to start a conversation that then might lead towards uh, cooperation. That's fine. Yes, sir. <coughs> Hello. Um, yeah, so my name is Ivan. I'm actually from Russia. I'm living here in Sanford. And, uh, I have uh, two, small, two small questions. So the first one, I heard you are growing the military presence in Europe, uh, increasing the amount of tanks and so on. So do you, do you see a real military threat from Russia there? Or something else that is leading that effort? And the second question, um, I know from my friends in Moscow and Ukraine even that the major obstacle in, in their opinion to resolving the crisis in Donbass is the political effort from Ukraine that is very hectic and very strange. So Russians try to negotiate with them, but they're making all sorts of very strange efforts there. Do you think the West could really assist on uh, on that side and uh, that, you know, uh, ask the Ukrainian leaders to, to cooperate? Thank you. Great. I'd be great to have you here to bring the other side of the conversation. <clears throat> so, when you use the word growing our military presence in Europe, uh, let me qualify what we're actually doing. Um, I do not think that you will ever see a military unit from America permanently move back to Europe. I don't think it has anything to do with the militaries. I don't think that any governor two senators and one or two congressmen in America is going to allow 30,000 jobs and families to move out of their district anyway. Think of all the Walmarts, Burger Kings, gas stations, all that stuff that goes away. So I don't think it's realistic to think that we're ever going to move permanently a military force from America to Europe. I could be surprised, but I feel free love while he's an optimist, is also a realist. I don't think that would be the case. So we are not going to permanently change anything. What I do think we are going to change is our ability to rapidly respond to aggression. And the way we're doing that is looking at more preposition material forward, which is without people, sits in a warehouse. But if aggression occurs, then we can rapidly move people to that equipment and develop military power. So I think you will see a regimen that increases our preposition capability forward so that we can rapidly, when these snap exercises continue, we can rapidly respond if we have to. Second thing is, while we need more forces forward, we accept that we're probably not going to permanently move any of them back to Europe, but we can rotationally deploy forces to Europe to increase our, our footprint on the continent. And so in a rotational but persistent heel-to-toe, as we call it, rotational way, we'll raise our military signature in Europe. And again, that is to better allow us to quickly respond to these snap exercises of 60,000 people on the Baltic borders. So that's the case that I think we're going to we're going to look at on military presence. On the, uh, clearly, your view of what's happening in Donbass, or whoever you're talking to, their view of what's happening in Donbass is that Kiev is not delivering on their side of the Minsk agreements. So the Minsk agreements, unfortunately, the way they were laid out, put almost all of the responsibility on Kiev first, 
before there's any delivery in the box. I think that's a conversation that's playing itself out on the ground. I don't, it's my opinion that neither side is perfect in this agreement and this arrangement yet. I think what's important is that we get to a point where we can stop the fighting along the line of contact. We had several weeks of that. And as you've watched the papers over the last three or four days, it's starting to match it back up. Um, the delay of the the delay of some of the elections has clearly not made uh, Moscow happy. They're ratcheting the violence up to deliver a message that you need to get more in line with the program. I think it's important that both sides of this issue, I think that the the Normandy format is a great format, but Normandy needs to bring pressure on both sides to move forward. Uh, if you are looking to reestablish the Ukrainian border and put it back in the control of the Ukrainian people, there is a lot of military equipment that needs to be moved out of the Donbass. In an unclassified uh, way, we say that there's over 1,500 armored vehicles that have been, it's more than that, but that's a classified number, but over 1,500 armored vehicles have been moved in from Russia into the Donbass. It's going to take a long time to get that stuff out of there. Again, as I talked about over here, why don't we have a show of faith and begin on both sides to truly demilitarize the Donbass, reestablish the border, and now I think you have a framework for cooperation. Yes, sir. So, uh, Carl, thank you very much. The Pacific Center and FSI General Next for spending time with us uh, last night and today. You mentioned uh, Afghanistan, and I think that it's fair to say that NATO's experience in Afghanistan fighting a counterinsurgency. Uh, led NATO to be extraordinarily proficient at the small unit level. Squads of 10 army or marines or platoons of 40 soldiers fighting this very decentralized war and all of what was being done made possible from the unblinking uh, eye up in the sky and precision fire support. But under your tenure as SAC your you're looking now at very different scenarios. And you're looking in scenarios where you can't assume we own the skies, we own the seas. And on that ground fight, you assume that you've got good small units. But they have to be able to operate in much, much larger formations. So is that correct that that is something that NATO needs to be looked at? And if so, what's your vision to get better? So thank you for that, Mr. Ambassador. And, and this is a place where we were actually prescient. Um, as we were, as I came into my job over two and a half years ago, um, we were looking at the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and there was no Donbass, there was no Crimea, there was no pressure at that time. And so we were really looking hard at what is the glue that's going to hold NATO together now if we don't have this outside of area large operation going on in Afghanistan. And at the time, we made a conclusion very similar to what you laid out, and that is that we have spent 13 or so years getting truly, exceptionally capable at counterinsurgency, at taking exquisite data and turning it into a precise, designated, mean point of impact, and of making an effect on the ground. That did not lend itself well to the larger uh, collective defense Article 5 issue that NATO has to face. And so what we said at the time, well before Russia, was that we need to reestablish the excellence that NATO used to have in this collective defense Article 5 uh, kind of situation. We, it had been literally decades since anybody in NATO, to include the United States of America, had exercised at the divisional or core level. We had really had not seen the need, other than in Korea, to do large unit uh, um, maneuver. And so we chose at that time 
to build a series of exercises to regain our ability as an alliance to do this large fight. In fact, we designed then the exercise that we just did last week of over uh, 26,000 troops, all the airplanes and ships that were a part of it, down in the Mediterranean. We chose the Mediterranean so as to not provoke. Um, and we did this huge exercise there to begin to regain those capabilities and capacities that we need to do that large fight. And so we were pressing because along comes Crimea, along comes Donbass, along comes Georgia, along comes Syria. And what we now see is the nations are clamoring for regaining the excellence in large force maneuver. And so we are uh, we are uniquely focused on that. Yes, ma'am. I'm Pat Clough, and the mother of, proud mother of a female Marine who is currently serving in Iraq for her third tour of duty in the Middle East. And I'm wondering if you would comment on whether or not we are resetting our strategy in Iraq, about to reset our strategy in Iraq, thinking about resetting our strategy in Iraq so that I can better understand why she's there. Yeah. Ms. Pat? Yes. Pat, I'm Phil Breedlove, the proud father of Rebecca Breedlove Hardy, who is also wearing our uniform. And so I share your concern about uh, sons and daughters who serve. Um, so uh, I will disqualify myself quickly and then I'll try to answer. That's really a better question asked to uh, Lloyd Austin and possibly our senior most political leadership as Lloyd is in charge of Iraq. And, that's really not part of my, my battle space. Um, and I think your question is a fair one and a good one. I think that we now have, we, the larger we, we have a real problem in Daesh and in uh, ISIL. Um, we, the Western world, are now reticent to put boots on the ground uh, to do this fight, and so we are in search of and working with other entities in that part of the world to try to uh, carry this fight to Daesh and ISIL. And to what degree we will use some of our exquisite capabilities to enable others on the ground to fight, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's all being worked out right now. And so I really have no way of describing whether we're resetting, redoing, or whatever our approach there. I think that um, we we all want in Iraq. We have we have so many of our nation's sons and daughters who paid a lot of price in Iraq. In the in the back, one of the gentlemen that is traveling with me, who helps me, he commanded a battalion that that lost soldiers there uh, to a degree. And so we all want success there. We all had hoped that we would find a government that could find an approach that uh, that got past the sectarian divide in that country and, and would reach across the aisle, if you, if you allow that term, uh, between the Shia and the Sunnah, and try to find a path forward for that nation. And I think they have under-delivered on our expectations on that. And Clearly, that's causing us a lot of problems. So we've got to figure out how to encourage this government to find its way past its sectarian issues, to unite their military to get the job done that we trained it to do, that we spent a lot of our blood and treasure to get it ready to do, and then have them step up to their responsibilities in Iraq. That's what I think we're searching for. There's a lot smarter people in this room on that than me. They would like to help me with that answer. I'm good for that. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Stephen Van General. I'm an alumnus of the Graduate School of Business here at Stanford. Um, I'm sure it's very difficult for you in any public forum to say very much about nuclear weapons. But I hope you will nevertheless allow me to ask you a question about them. Um, I don't know whether you'd agree with this. It seems to me the last time we had a robust public debate about nuclear weapons was in the 1980s. And at that time, we were able, I would argue, largely as a 
consequence of having such a good, robust political debate within the Alliance about nuclear weapons to get the Pershing um, II's nuclear weapons deployed, and ultimately, of course, to get the INF Treaty in 1987. Um, when I look at, or try to look at, the Russian attitudes and actions in relation to nuclear weapons, now I'm confused. Because as far as I know, on the one hand, the Russians continue diligently to observe their obligations under the New START Treaty. Um, I believe they're withdrawing their warheads and uh, delivery vehicles exactly as they're supposed to do. On the other hand, we have the nuclear saber rattling, as um, Secretary uh, Carter described it on Saturday, going on, which is alarming. And we also have, I believe, everybody who knows these things seems to agree, a serious breach of the INF Treaty, um, I believe to do with the development of the new cruise missile. So my question is, how do we respond, how do you interpret these Russian actions, number one? Um, and what is the appropriate way for the Alliance to respond? And do you, when you do your, your force planning and prepare your advice to political authorities, do you feel you have the nuclear capabilities and posture that you need. And if we need something different, what is it that we need? Yeah. So I will satisfy in a few regards, and I will not satisfy in others because I, there is a limit to what I can talk about on some of these things. But, but let me enter the larger debate. Um, yes, we are talking about this a lot. Why are we talking about this a lot? Because of what you have mentioned, the sort of nuclear saber rather. What we have found over the years that is that Russia writes about what they do, usually well in advance of doing it. And we see various philosophies out there, some things actually labeled doctrines, the Gerasimov Doctrine and others. We see these philosophies which are much written about and discussed. And one of the ones that is the toughest to deal with is this Russian approach called escalate to de-escalate. In other words, because they know they don't have conventional parity with the West, if they enter into a, 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 a fight with the West, and they get to a point where the West builds a certain amount of power that is worrisome, then they see nuclear weapons as a normal part of the continuation of conflict used to escalate so as to de-escalate. <coughs> So these are very destabilizing discussions. How do you, how do you have any conversation about how we, we resolve conflict if it starts, if, if every conversation is that the other side will not allow a defeat and will use nuclear weapons to avoid it. And that's essentially the philosophy that's been discussed. And then what you see is the saber rattling all over the place, even at the highest levels. For a while, it was only at the ministerial level. We heard the ministers talking about putting nukes into Crimea, et cetera, et cetera. And then, boom, Putin gets out and talks about buying 40 new ICDMs as a response to something. What we really need is those were already in his budget. He just used them as an announcement to get splash in the paper, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is what I would have said in the public many times irresponsible talk by an political power. So this is uh, very much um, a question that we have to deal with. You, you are a little more optimistic about New START than I. You said they're meeting their obligations. I think they are slowly approaching their obligations. Clearly not the speed that we've chose to meet our obligations. The speeds don't match. The last part is the really tough part, and I really can't say much. I would just say that we, we in the West, many nations, it's in the public debate, this is not classified, we do believe that they have now broken multiple times the INF and, and are in fact testing a, a missile that is thus the INF treaty. Our secretary, if you would go back and read his, one of his first testimonies, he laid out a construct where he said, we will respond. We will respond in diplomatic channels, we will respond in economic channels, and we will respond in military channels. He uses a few more words. I would encourage you to Google it and read it, but that's about as far as I can go here, and I know that dissatisfies, but that's, 
That's as far as I can go on that. Yes, we have to address this. Our, our secretary has said that we will not allow Russia to go to a place where they enjoy an asymmetric advantage, and that we'll have to respond in those three channels. And at that point, I'll have to stop the discussion. So back there. Well, Jeff Rosenbaum, and what I see in this discussion looks like the Russian authority to the president of Bolivar can make a step forward, can make a step back. But I don't think that this is completely true. Because in such situation in Russia, presses him hard. And now, starting in response to some uh, situation, I see really every day in Russia, maybe even that we speak with these people, one more population should Population should suffer to be questioned for the sake of one preparedness. And this makes this like a possibility to my own very limited. It is easy to step forward. It's very difficult to step back because he will be weak, like a uh, leader, which is not acceptable in Russia. And for uh, this reason, I think it is permanent fact. It will never go out because kind of as a moment of social and other problems. And I don't see how it more or less it may, my opinion more pessimistic. It's an almost modern market. I think that the present migration crisis in Europe plants the seeds of future ethnical and religious conflicts of future, future generations. Thank you. So uh, let me agree with much of what you said. Um, on the first piece, and I'll have just a word to say on the migration. There is a real dynamic that worries us, which is that uh, in order to keep the focus of the Russian people on these things that Russia is doing exterior to its national boundaries, that a fierce nationalism has been whipped up, that this nationalism has grown and inertia, which is going to be really hard to stop, etc., etc. I'm not sure if that's correct or not. I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a social scientist. I believe that the pundits and the smart people that I wrap myself in sometimes have explained this to me, and I, I trust their judgment, that this is going to be a problem, that focusing the nation in this nationalistic way does make it awfully hard for them to fall back back to this conversation over here about where do we find that first step that enables us to have a conversation that gives us to cooperation. The ability to take a step back because of this position that they built in their media and their people makes it really hard for Russia to be able to find a place where we can meet some common ground to then begin to talk. And so this is a dynamic that is really hard and I share your concerns on that. On the migrants, being a future seed of unrest and problems. I hear it both ways, and I don't think that I've truly formed all that good a personal opinion yet. There are those in Europe whose nations need a certain influx of uh, people who are willing to take jobs that their own internal population don't find value in anymore. And so they see some of this migration as a good thing. Although last night, a very smart individual pointed out to me that most of the people leaving Syria are the upper crust people because they can afford it. And they're most of them educated relatively well. And they're not going to be in the mood for taking the jobs that some of the European nations really want them to take. These are professionals who want to enter into a more uh, lucrative arrangement. And so there may be a mismatch in this expectation. But what I can say is that the nations of Europe their social fabric is being stretched in its response. Um, I would tell you that the Lebanese will tell you that their mission has fundamentally changed. Fundamentally changed. Uh, the northern part of Georgia is at risk, or Georgia, Jordan, is at risk of fundamentally changing. And Turkey now has over 2 million immigrants in Turkey. These are going to be issues for the immediate surrounding as much and even as much as the problems that we'll, we'll see in Europe. 
But I do tell you that there are those who see this as an opportunity, and there, there are others that see this as challenging the very fabric of their nation. So uh, I haven't fallen down on either side of that securely yet. Yes, sir. So, um, General Breedlove says he's not a political scientist, but tomorrow, just to advertise again, at 5.30, a real political scientist from Russia, Lilia Serbsova, will be speaking over at the Bechtel Center and will answer your questions, so come to that talk, okay? Um, two quick questions to a military specialist. Um, uh, we have seen the Russian military in action now in Ukraine and Syria. Uh, update us in terms of the way you look at it compared to, say, Georgia 2008 or even the Chechen War. There's been a lot of money spent on military modernization. How does it look to you in terms of the new capabilities they have? And second, as you mentioned, and as, as Putin himself has said many times, it is a Russian strategic objective to uh, divide NATO. Uh, give us your assessment of how well that campaign for Moscow is doing. Okay, excellent. These I do find myself somewhat capable of speaking to. So, so I think by all accounts, whether you're a military person or not, the Russian uh, uh, invasion in Georgia did not go well. They got their nose bloody badly. They were unable to integrate aviation fires into ground fires. They they were unaware of the lethality of their own missile systems, which they had put into Georgia, and Georgia used against them to shoot some of their aircraft down. So Georgia was not well done, and it was done basically by brute force, a huge nation working on a much smaller nation. But to their great credit, they are a learning and adaptive force. Uh, Mr. Putin started uh, Seven, five to seven years ago, with a very aggressive campaign to recapitalize, retrain, and reorient the military. And so when Russia invaded Crimea, they had cleaned up most of the bad mistakes they made in Georgia. Much better use of jam, much better use of the electronic warfare suites, much better use of tying aviation to ground, etc., etc., etc. And so learning adaptive, they, they got much better from Georgia to Crimea. In Crimea, they made some mistakes in this thing we're now calling hybrid war. You know, we sort of outed the little green men early. We said, these are Russians, and the Russians denied that they were Russians for several months, and then they admitted it openly. But um, they made mistakes in how to hide their actions in this hybrid attack into Crimea. And so when they went into Donbass, they were much better than they were in Crimea. Again, a learning adaptive force. So they made investments across the last five to seven years. And they have learned from every conflict and the mistakes that they made in those conflicts. And what they learned in Donbass about how to tie uh, aerial vehicles, UAVs, the press likes to call them drones, I hate that word. But UAVs and RPAs, how they tie those to artillery, et cetera, et cetera. They perfected this in the loss. The Russian UAVs and uh, the way they tie it to their artillery spotting, et cetera, they really got good at it. And they have transferred that now to Syria. So um, investing the, the kits, the capabilities has gone up. Uh, and they have learned in each one of these invasions that they've run over the past few years. So um, there, this is a very different military than in 2008. But we learned after the Cold War, when we thought that Russia was 10 feet tall, that it was really maybe 8 feet tall. And we don't want to paint again the Russia that's 10 feet tall now, because it's not smaller. But that force that they have, that multiple battalion task force force that was sitting on the Ukraine border in the middle of last year. That is a group of battalions that are very ready and very capable. So there is a force there that is quite concerning. Um, on the second piece, um, Russia, as I said in my speech, wants to rewrite the rules, not break the rules. 
I think when Russia looks to the south, they see China. They see a great big nation that can build individually with the nations around it. China and Vietnam, China and Cambodia, China and China and bilaterally they can work on that. When Russia looks to the West, they see the EU and NATO. They have to deal with a large, capable body of nations in two cases. I think Russia very much wants to have a relationship with the West like China has with its South. They want to deal individually, big nation on small nation with the nations of the West. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about rewriting the rules. They don't want to have to deal with the EU and NATO. So one of their greatest goals in almost every venture they have is to split or divide EU on sanctions, split or divide NATO on military response. And if they can get in and find a crack in those two alliances, they will live in that crack and make it bigger until the point where they make it dysfunctional. If they make the EU or NATO dysfunctional, they get everything else they want. So I think that's a fair approach. That's sort of way over here. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Sandy Carhali. I'm a senior at Stanford. Uh, part of Russia's strategic ambitions, part of Russia's strategic ambitions for a long time now, for hundreds of years, has been gaining access to and maintaining access to warm water ports for the commercial shipping and naval fleets. Uh, from NATO's perspective, does European security preclude Russia's access to these ports, or is there a mutually agreeable solution in, in this issue? So, uh, I think it would be incorrect of NATO to adopt a strategy that would say that any nation, Russia or you name any other nation, should not have certain things like access to the air, access to the sea. I think it's highly irregular for us to stand up and say, because we are the West, we think we should deny Russia access to warm water ports. I don't think that to be the case. Um, I think nations are, are part of our sovereignty our, across the world is to establish those alliances and those relationships that allow us to further our our economic interests around the world. As I said before, I think that part of uh, uh, Europe whole free of peace and prosperous is Russia. It has to be. So I, I don't think that it's our position in life or position in the world to try to deny Russia anything. Now, now what we expect when a nation has a port is good behavior. Not to turn that port into a position of projection of military power. Um, look at what is in Kaliningrad. Look at what is in Crimea. These are pretty, pretty potent uh, places for projecting power. That's not the kind of thing that we would hope for. But um, I think it would be absolutely absurd for us to just say we don't want Russia to have access to warm water ports. I don't think that's our station in life. Let's turn back. Lord Hansen here at uh, Secret. Uh, a very different question, I guess. Um, a lot of discussion in space, in commercial space, and, and perhaps in the defense side, that ITAR keeps cooperation between U.S. and European space um, companies from happening as effectively that. Your thoughts on that, and does ITAR need to be changed to allow better cooperation? Mm -hmm. I think I'm out of my, uh, out of my mission space here. Um, as the Army would say, if I was to take a position on that, I think I'd be shooting on someone else's target. Um, I am all about cooperation. I am all about, especially in space, how do we uh, better utilize space, how do we make it more resilient, how do we prepare for situations where not only commercially, but militarily we can build redundancy and capability should our space assets be uh, challenged. So I think I'm going to dodge your question by saying I'm all about cooperating and leave it there. Because you let me do that. That's smart. I learned a long time ago that I'm a military man and not a politician. And I need to firmly remain that. <laughs> yes, sir. Is it 
Georgia Tech man, I think you can perhaps appreciate my characterization of European and soon coming to our shores, American uh, immigration policy is a rambling wreck. Uh, by your own admission, you have said that uh, these refugees, the vast majority of which are uh, military aged Muslim males, uh, with some reports up to 80%. By your own words, it is an untraceable flow. The mm -hmm. best we can do is to uh, stay ahead of hope, to stay ahead of the various uh, radical Islamic plots, as well as you're saying, exceedingly difficult to do that. Would this not gravitate towards having a policy of perhaps contain, containment, which is to say, uh, there are 56 Muslim countries in the world. I would you not, with vast geographic experiences, vast way of wealth, could not these refugees be encouraged, and far more strongly than encouraged, to stay in their sphere where uh, they have a common religion, a common culture, a common geography, a common mindset? You know what I'm getting at. Yeah. So I firmly fall on both sides of the argument, and let me, let me attack it in this way. Um, is there anyone in this room whose family did not, who's an American, is there anyone in this room whose family did not immigrate to America? So the question is, are there any Native American Indians in this room? The answer is no. So that means that all the rest of us are products of immigrants. So immigration in itself, I don't think, is the issue. Clearly, though, as you rightly lay out, right now, as you clearly lay out, immigration in the form that we see it now in the Mediterranean and across the land bridge of Turkey and others, this is clearly a huge problem. And you picked up on the things that I'm worried about. I think in that. In that immigration, I believe, are legitimate immigrants who are fleeing bad governments, ungoverned spaces, and terrorists. Um, but also embedded in that is the things that you talked about. Also embedded in that is just plain old criminality, terrorists, and foreign fighters. And I'll explain the difference if you'd like to talk about that. Criminality, terrorists, uh, foreign fighters, and other what you and I would agree are, are not helpful people. So we have to address this. Here is the, the dilemma, I think. Many nations around the world, and I don't say this in a condescending way, but many nations around the world, when they see a problem, the first reaction is throw the military at it. We uh, in the military, and I don't know if you use it here, we use a model called DIME, as in the coin. Diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. And those broadly, poorly, but broadly describe the elements of a nation's power as diplomatic power, informational power, military power, and economic power. Here's my assertion that the solution to these problems of huge migrant flows fall more in the diplomatic, informational, and economic than they do in the military. A military solution can put a band-aid or physically stop a flow. But until you address the root cause of the flow, you're just going to have more flow and it's going to flow in different directions and flow around different places. So I agree with, I think, the premise which is embedded in your, in your, uh, your question that there are roles for the military to play to physically stop this. But to the larger question of what is the policy, use the word containment or whatever, to the larger question of the policy, that's a diplomatic issue. That is something that, as a military man, we can make advice to our political masters, but it'll be a political decision how in the end we address this. And then informational and economic means will be needed to fix it. Um, as well as the military to enable the solution. So I guess my answer to you is that if we're really going to address the immigration flow and the problems that it brings out of the Middle East and out of North Africa across the, the Mediterranean, 
our entire government and the governments of all of our nations are going to have to be involved. Our 28 nation alliance or the 28 plus nation EU, if all they do is throw their military at it, we will put a temporary band-aid on it and it will get worse. Until the nations of the EU, this is my opinion, I'm busted. I'm getting a little bit out there right now. But my opinion is until our nations, all of them, involve their entire government repertoire to address the issue, we'll not fix it. And so, as a military man, we will do those things that the nations asked us. But if we're truly going to fix the problem, it will take our different diplomatic and governmental efforts, our informational efforts, and our economic efforts wrapped around what the military can do. Just General, you only have time for one more question, with all due respect, and why don't we just let Alec and go and ask it right here. Okay. So, can they see you afterwards? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave a little time for afterwards. Last question. I think your talk was really excellent. But ever since the Russians sent their forces into Donbass, I've been very worried about the Baltics with their substantial Russian speaking population. And what can and should be done about that? I'd be very interested in hearing your assessment of the Baltics and what we're doing and what we ought to be doing. So um, what I would offer is this is clearly on the minds of a lot of people. Um, I do believe that Mr. Putin understands and respects a NATO country. If you remember the list of things that I ripped off starting in Georgia and walking around the world, those are not NATO nations. And so I truly believe that Mr. Putin understands a NATO boundary. So that doesn't say that he will never cross the boundary into the Baltics. But what it argues for is that I believe Mr. Putin understands the gravity of making a decision to take on NATO and Article 5. So I think there's a deterrent value there. But we are clearly concerned about that. I think we're even more concerned about this thing that you've heard talked about so much in the press lately. Some call it hybrid war. Some, I like to usually call it unconventional war. The, the bottom line is what you saw on the leading edge of Crimea was a classic uh, Gerasimov model of hybrid war, employing uh, pressures diplomatically, employing a media campaign, employing economic pressure, and then finally military pressure in the form of first little green men, if you remember that. So I think what we worry now as much about is that he understands that crossing a NATO border in the Baltic Sea and with a military force, that is a red line. Remember what the nation said at Wales, um, and our own president said, we will defend every inch of NATO territory. So I think that he understands that. But he might use this more hybrid approach to stir up issues. Just this past week, again in the Duma, they had a big pronunciation that Russia will defend and protect Russian-speaking people all over the world. 24% of Estonia is Russian-speaking people. And so the concern is that they might build that more hybrid approach to try to undermine the government of Estonia. And I think that's where we're focusing uh, a lot of effort right now is to help nations who are at risk to understand uh, this business of how do you approach uh, a hybrid war. And we are using those tools that we have to help nations develop, I use these words a lot, I apologize, capabilities and capacities to address a hybrid approach inside of their nation. And that's ongoing steady work right now in the office. So, uh, General, I know you're not a diplomat, you said that a couple of times. Uh, but in my opinion, both what you do and say that has occurred in Russia, he's one of the most famous sectors we've ever had in Russia. I think you've got to go back to Eisenhower, in fact, to know somebody who's more known in Russia. I follow on Twitter, both of us every day. Uh, but the public diplomacy that you do here for in our own country, you're actually a great spokesman for our policy, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come all the way out to the West Coast, and the sun has now come out for a few minutes. So thank you so much. For